thank you all for coming out and uh, joining us for our Biophilia meetup for June. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, I'm Emily Kelnicki. I'm the director of the Science Education and Research Department here at Phipps. And this is a monthly meeting that we have, the first Thursday of every month. And we're just very pleased to have and see all of you here this evening. I always start this way, so apologies to those that are coming monthly. But for how many of you, this is your first time here? Great. Welcome, lots of you. Well, welcome to all you newcomers. Hopefully you uh, return again in future months as topics interest you. Uh, for those that, since there's a lot of you, that this is your first time, uh, the format I will uh, briefly introduce our presenter for this evening. And then I hand it over to Susan Spangler, who's here to lead us through a guided meditation, a brief meditation. And then we hand it over to Norma. And we usually leave about um, there, 15 minutes thereabouts for a group question and answer. We wrap up at about 7. You'll see me stand up. Uh, take the last question, and then those that want to or, and are able to stay and engage in a, a smaller conversation are welcome to stay here until closer to, to 7.30, because welcome. Because uh, the idea behind these monthly events is to really engage with the material and have an opportunity to network with other people in the community that are really interested in similar ideas. So we really do hope that you stay um, and are able to, to talk and uh, meet people after the event as well. And feel free, the restrooms are across the way, and there are some light refreshments as well if you haven't had a chance to have those. So without further ado, um, I will introduce our presenter this evening. So Norma Weinberg lives in Harvard Square in Cape Cod's Lake Weequaquit. Did I get that right? Weequaquit. Weequaquit. Uh, she's an herbal educator, writer, speaker, master gardener, and what grows where world traveler. She has written multiple resource books, including Herbal Secrets for Gardeners, Natural Hand Care, Henna from Head to Toe, Natural Remedies for Carpal Tunnel Syndrome, Herbal Hand Creams and Salves, and The Herbal Home Spa. She is the originator of, originator, excuse me, of the cable television series, Herb's Daughter, and is the founder of the Healing Herbal Medicine and Cancer Conference. She is also a former chair of the New England Unit of the Herb Society of America, which I know we have a number of members here tonight. Welcome, all of you. And she's also a regular contributor to Penny Royal Papers. Her column, The Herb Traveler, takes readers around the globe for insights into the ethnobotanical uses of a country's varied gardens and how plants are used for food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. So please join me in, in welcoming Norma. And prior to welcoming Norma, we'll welcome Susan to lead us through a, a guided exercise. Thank you. So yes, welcome everyone. Um, these first few moments really are just an opportunity for us all to fully settle in here together so we can fully engage with what Norma will bring for us. So if you let yourself take a comfortable position um, with your feet flat on the ground, if that's comfortable for you. And we might begin just with noticing whatever it is you're arriving with this, this evening whatever body sensations, feelings, or thoughts. And whatever you find, however it is, pleasant or unpleasant, actually with a deep breath, just letting yourself allow yourself to be here just as it is. And letting your awareness move to the soles of your feet. Feeling the feet rooted in the earth. Feeling the sensations of the body. Simply relaxing in the chair. And if the mind is wandering, if you're feeling not quite here, simply noticing that too, and do whatever you is possible 
letting your awareness leave the body. And finding a place where you can feel the body breathing. Feel the belly. Right now, rising and falling at the abdomen. And simply let your mind rest in the feeling of the body breathing just for a moment. It helps to close your eyes and close your eyes. to rise and fall as the rise and fall of the breath. Just as is, nothing you have to do. And as um, thoughts arise, then you can float right through that like you still stream. And then awareness again rests in the body with the feeling of the body breathing. And together, let's take two or three deep, full breaths in. As you exhale, letting go of any tension you might be holding. Breathing in deeply. Letting go fully. One more time, breathing in deeply. are closed and you look in your eyes. And you can allow yourself to continue to enjoy your breathing as we invite Norma to offer her wisdom. Thank you so much. That was really nice. Very nice. I'm sure everybody leads hectic lives one way or another. And to just take a few moments to catch your breath and just relax is really wonderful. And thank you all for coming this evening. I know everyone has a bunch of things on their schedule. So um, I'm really glad to see this nice turnout. Um, how many of you here are gardeners? Oh, how many of you are not gardeners? <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's great. Um, how many of you have herb gardens or know a little bit about herbs? Good amount. Excellent. Okay. So um, today we're going to talk about gardening with herbs through a sustainable lens. And I have to tell you that I am still learning about this myself. So I won't call myself the world's expert, but I did a lot of homework. And so I'm very much open to any of your experiences and thoughts on sustainable gardening. Um, but because we have just a particular time limit, I'm going to start. You might, you might need to take notes or you might not. So uh, can you, first of all, can you all hear me? Yeah. And can you all see the slide? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you can go to the second one. So, gardening with herbs through a sustainable lens. And here's the question. What is sustainable gardening? Sustainable gardening means low maintenance, eco-friendly, and the goal of sustainability is to conserve resources, which we know are dwindling. And it's also to think about it as a lifestyle, not just with gardening, with living. And 
if you can get into it, even when toe into the water in this, it's going to have immediate and long-term rewards. So there are several parts to sustainable gardening. Uh, composting is one. There we are. And uh, composting recycles and enriches the soil. It improves your soil. Another word that is used very often by gardeners, it amends your soil, it adds to your soil. And um, composting is one way, and uh, when you do that, it should usually be aged compost, not like fresh out of your house. <laughs> Another way to uh, compost is using mulch and ground covers to amend the soil. And why are we doing that? We're doing that, the reason to do that, besides making the soil better, is to help the soil hold on to the precious water that it needs to grow the plants. That's the, one of the reasons. And then another part of sustainable gardening is conserving water resources, utilizing every renewable resource. Uh, in, including trying to collect uh, rainwater, but also switching away from the sprinkler that we see a lot on gardens, uh, especially on lawns, and utilizing as much as possible in your garden beds drip irrigation, because actually your plants' roots are, are looking for the water, and the leaves love to get that water when it rains on them, but they the roots really are craving that water. So drip irrigation is a great way to go. Okay. So then another segment of sustainable gardening is um, choosing and growing native plants and <coughs> suitable for your climate and your area. And I have just started doing this on Cape Cod and basically because the house that we live on on Cape Cod, by the way, I should say, this is Steve, he is our tech guy. Without him, there's no slideshow, so. <laughs> anyway, we should thank him at the end. Um, and because I live within 100 feet of a lake, it's called Lake Wee Pocket, back in pocket, Wee Pocket, um, the uh, Conservation Commission was very fussy about uh, any plants that were within 100 feet of the lake had to be native. So because I am also, I'm into herbs, but I'm also an herbalist, and I, I try to help people that get poison ivy, and it turns out that there are herbs that actually can help you with that. And um, one of the herbs is called sweet fern, and it's actually a bush. It's, it's got the name fern in it, but it actually has a woody root. And the Native Americans used to make tea from the leaves, and also if you get bothered by poison ivy, if you put some of the leaves in a, uh, a cheesecloth and then tie it over your bathtub faucet and sit and take sort of a coolish bath with the water running through that sweet fern, it really soothes the poison ivy. So native plants have value as well as the fact that when I find that even with the climate changing or freezing temperatures or lots of wind or shocks with cold, that the sweet fern plants seem to be like immune to being bothered by it. Whereas some of these hybrids that we buy that we want to bring into our garden and that we order from catalogs far away, they aren't making it. And also the bunny rabbits and the other uh, deer, well, whatever, they seem to love the hybrid things, you know, so they end up eating off the heads of the flowers and things like that. So native plants have some benefits. And um, so I would say to take a look into what is native in your area and try to add it to your garden. You will find that it will make gardening easier because they're more forgiving. Um, all right, let's see. Okay. So I don't know, how many people, has anyone ever been to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center? A couple of you, it's really, isn't it a wonderful place? It's totally, it's in, it's in Austin, Texas. And Lady Bird Johnson had another plug for native plants. She said, 
it gives us a sense of where we are in this great country by seeing what's growing native. And if you travel then, I know I'm always looking for what's familiar, but then I also start to see, well, what's different here that isn't in my, my own backyard? So, okay, that's another part. So I did say to you that native plants better tolerate drought and harsh winters, require less water, and save time, effort, and energy, and money. And okay, so the heirloom seeds is another category of sustainable gardening. And who knows what, what does that mean? Who, who would like to give us a little definition? What's an heirloom, an heirloom plant or an heirloom seed? Okay, yes. It's a plant that we've been growing in this area for a very long time. <clears throat> Everything is good, although it doesn't have to be in this area. So uh, here's a way to think of heirloom. Heirloom, think of it as grandma and great grandma's seeds, or especially with tomatoes. I mean, you can walk into a supermarket or even a Whole Foods, and you see the most beautiful tomatoes, but when you hold them to your nose, there's no scent. And when you bite into them, there's no taste. But if you can get heirloom tomato plants that haven't been hybridized, uh, you're going to find they may not look the most beautiful, but they will taste the most beautiful, and they will smell the most beautiful. So if you can, when it comes to fruits and vegetables especially, try to look for heirloom plants when you go to buy those plants, and you'll be surprised. And just on the way, I will come back to it, but I'll say it quickly, because we're going to talk about another thing in a minute. If you are, how many of you are going to plant tomatoes this year? So if you plant a basal plant in with your tomato, the basal plant will enrich the soil for the tomato, and it will also keep away pests. So that's companion planting. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so um, uh, another factor in sustainable gardening is substituting beneficial insects for pesticides. And um, there can be good bugs for your garden to control the pests. You need their natural enemies. And um, there are three Ps. Think of three Ps for beneficial insects, okay? There are pollinators, predators, and parasites. The three Ps, pollinators, predators, and parasites. And we'll get into that in a minute. So these are these are species and insects that perform valuable services to our gardens. And um, you can also plant herbs that will attract these beneficial insects. So it's sort of a whole circle of things. Um, let's see, do I want to get into that? I can get into it. Okay, so some of the beneficial insects are ladybugs or lady beetles, green lacewings that eat aphids and caterpillars, and fly predators. So, and there's more, there's so much more, but we don't have time to get into every single one. Um, all right, so the pollinators would be honeybees and butterflies, and the predators might be uh, the lady beetles or soldier bugs. And the parasites are, um, are the kind of bugs that use the pests, as, uh, the garden pests, as nurseries for their young, and they inject their eggs into, um, into the pests, and then I sort of finish them off. Um, I guess that um, what you need to do to try to do this, I don't know what the next slide is. Oh, that part on that, but that's okay, um, is you need to set out the welcome mat to attract these beneficial insects. And um, and one of the ways to do that is uh, to, to plant particular herbs that are going to be welcome mats for each one of these three peas. And here's a little term that I liked. It's called use chocolate box ecology. Chocolate box ecology. Has anyone ever heard that term? And so it means plant your garden so there are blooms all year round, not just it's all going to happen in the spring and whatever. And so it's like that chocolate box is waiting 
you can entice, but then you've got you've got the herbs. So, and the other important thing to attract beneficials is to water your gardens regularly because they also need water or liquids. Okay, so um, herbs are designed to repel pests, and they are easy to grow. They are low maintenance. They add color, fragrance and beauty to your garden, and they taste good too, so fresh is more flavorful. All right, so we'll talk about companion planting, because that slides up next. And, um, oh, is there someone that can help pass out? I don't know if we have enough, but th this is an old time companion planting guideline, but it is so good that I just thought you would all maybe like that, yeah. So, um, we'll, we'll talk about that. So what is companion planting? So just so you understand it. Companion planting are plants that benefit each other, so that attract or deter pests, that help to improve the soil, and also improve a crop's flavor. Some of the herbs, and we go ahead to all right, so as an example, um, marigolds deter pests and release toxins through their roots to, call nematode, to kill nematodes. And marigolds are also very good for fooling animals if they are coming to uh, disturb your garden. And catnip is one place where you want to plant marigolds in front of the catnip. But, um, Nasturtiums act as a trap to draw pests away from the main crop. So you would plant nasturtiums near lettuce or roses. Okay. Fennel. Fennel is an, is an herb that attracts beneficials. Um, and it attracts pollinators like bees and butterflies and hoverflies and ladybugs or lady beetles and lady beetles control aphid pests. But let me say this, how many of you have planted fennel in your garden ever? So have you noticed that fennel doesn't like to grow next to mostly every other plant? The only plant that fennel likes to grow near is dill. Fennel likes to grow near everything. Mm -hmm. But it, it usually- It is very robust and I definitely stole it. Really? Oh, it loves my Orchard come herb garden come Really? All right, so uh, I find that I that it tends to kill off some of my other plants. It really is a loner. In general, it's a loner. But you, you, must, you must have a hybrid one that is friendly. Bronze fennel. <laughs> Bronze fennel. Oh, yes, okay. So, um, okay. Let's see, fennel. Okay, uh, go ahead. Now, sometimes, uh, I have a thing with Scots that wants you to kill your dandelion and, and other, other plants, but let me say to you that dandelions are a good weed. They help condition your soil, they bring trace minerals to the soil surface, and they're a great thing to have where you have fruit trees. So, I mean, that's surprising, but I will tell you that you're stuck anyway because a single plant can sow as many as 5,000 seeds. One dandelion plant, 5,000 seeds. And then if you want to know this, we did not have dandelions here before the pilgrims made their way over. Settlers to the Americas brought dandelion to our shores. And why did they do that? They brought that because it was an important, bitter spring tonic. And just as a quick, a little aside, can anybody name what our taste buds are? What do we have that we can taste in our mouth? Salty, 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 sour, umami. Umami, spicy? No, it's meaty. Meaty? Salty, sour, bitter, and savory. All right, so, but if you were to say to yourself, okay, what do we eat in the American diet that's bitter? Coffee. Coffee. Okay. Arugula. 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 What? Endive. 
and, and die of fear. And radicchio. But there's not like tons of stuff, right? Now, Americans tend to stay away from bitter. And then if you look at all the drug ads, like having trouble with your digestion? Yeah. Buy this pill, buy that pill, buy this pill, take that pill. We, why do we have a bitter taste bud? One reason is, of course, to warn us about poisons that we might be ingesting. And the other is because when you taste something bitter, what happens in your mouth? You start to salivate. And what does that saliva do? It helps us to digest our food. And by not including enough bitter, your digestion is impaired. So dandelion is an important bitter spring tonic. And also dandelions actually improve soil health. Uh, the taproot, which is a long taproot, breaks up compacted soil. It makes, it creates paths for earthworms. <coughs> dandelion roots pull up nutrients from the subsoil, delivering these nutrients to its leaves. And here's another amazing fact about dandelions. Uh, dandelions have more beta carotene than almost any other fruit or vegetable. Beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A, an antioxidant that promotes healthy skin and lessens the risk for stroke, coronary artery disease, macular degeneration, and other age-related ailments. The leaves also contain lutein, which is an important ingredient for eye health. So, um, what did you say? Italian? Somebody said yes. I said the Italian too. They do. Okay. So if you wanted to go wild forage, foraging for dandelions, I'm going to quickly tell you. First of all, dandelions are a signal that winter is over and things are going to bloom again. The leaves are most tender before you see the flower. And what you need to harvest, you need a pristine field, you need to be at least 75 feet away from a roadway. It's not really good to be picking the dandelions where the trucks and cars are going by. And then you need a spade, a knife, and a bucket, and a way to slice the plant a few inches below the top of the root, below the top of the root, so the leaves remain together in clusters. I have a real quick, easy recipe, even for, um, summer dandelion because tea, because we're into summer. So I'm going to tell you just quickly how to make dandelion tea. You need a cool, don't, remember, don't do it if your dog has been peeping all over your flowers. But if you can find a field where it's away from the road and away from people, animals, then take your bucket and collect a quart of dandelion flowers in a heat-proof pitcher. And a quart, and then you can give a quick rinse right off if you want to. Then pour a quart of boiling water over those dandelions, steep covered for one hour, strain, discard the flowers. If you want, add a half a cup of sugar to taste. You can chill it and you can drink it hot or cold dandelion tea and it's good for you. Unless you're allergic to dandelions. How many people are allergic to dandelions here? How many people in the room are allergic to something? There's quite a few. We could dandelions quickly. Are lettuce. What? Dandelions are lettuce. Is anybody allergic to dandelions? Lettuce. People are allergic to everything. I mean, every time I ask this question, I find people that are allergic to sunshine, people that are allergic to the wind, people that are allergic to everything. We could just quickly, who wants to say what they're allergic to? Muscles. What? Muscles. Muscles. Cilantro, that's me. What else? Poison ivy. Poison ivy. I remember that for you. What else? Aspergillus fungus. Where do you find that aspergillus fungus? In every piece of dirt. In dirt. <laughs> what happens to you? Uh, sinus. Sinus headache. Right. So I mean, that's new and free. I have a skin over that before that. Okay. So um, let's go to the next one. All right. So these are some more. Um, uh, beneficial herbs that will bring beneficials to your uh, to your garden. Stinging nettle. Now this one's a little challenging because you don't want to really be touching it unless you're wearing gloves. Um, these weeds support more than 40 beneficial insects and are vital for the survival of some butterflies and moth larvae. And you usually find them in the woods or the edge of the woods. Does it grow here? It does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next. 
Alright, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. Stinging hair chips break off and toxins mix of acid and protein enter the body. Some the stings are itching and irritating but not dangerous. It is a host plant for moths and butterflies, including red admiral, painted lady, question mark, satyr, angle wing, whatever. Um, now, it is medicinal, uh, it improves nasal inflammation, urinary disorders, but you have to like cook it and get rid of those hairs. Uh, culinary, it can be thrown into soup or tea or salads. It has vitamins A, C, D, and E, potassium, calcium, and iron. And you usually find it in disturbed landscapes, forest clearings, and moist woods. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, Try to get a copy of Peterson's Guide to Medicinal Plants. That's a wonderful book that will help you to identify uh, identify plants in general. Okay. Um, so now we've talked about beneficials. We've talked back and forth about companion plants. So two of my favorite companion plants are plantain, and I'm not talking about the baby bananas from South America. <laughs> I'm talking about Plantago species, which is Plantago major, which is a chubbier leaf, and Plantago lanceolata, which is more like a knife-shaped leaf. And uh, the back of the leaf has heavy ribs on it, and it usually, people say, it's weed, but it is a very helpful weed. As a matter of fact, you'll usually find plantain growing in a field. I don't know if, I, I don't know if we have a picture of plantain. Do we? You think we do? Okay, that's it. So this is Plantago major, and you can see the, rib, the ribs, and then it has almost this wheat-like flower. I'm sorry, what? <coughs> Don't put that up. No, nope. I'm gonna tell you what to do about that. You know, it is the most fabulous plant. So because it likes to grow in fields where lots of bees are, if you get stung by a bee, First of all, if you're allergic, you should have an happy pen. But if you are not allergic, you should take a credit card or a butter knife and get the stinger out, and then look for a plantain leaf. Wipe it off on the pants on your pants legs, then put it put it in the front of your mouth near your tongue. Don't ever throw it in the back of your mouth because you have to get rid of it for one reason or another. You gotta be able to spit it out. So you just macerate it. Don't swallow it, chew it up. And then put that macerated plantain leaf right on the bee sting. And in less than a minute, that bee sting will not hurt you at all anymore. It takes the sting away. And yet, it grows in a field where there are bees. And so, um, get to know that. Plantago major or Plantago lanceolata, both of them are fabulous. Um, all right, so now yarrow. Yarrow, the and I, Here's another thing. If you don't know a lot about herbs or you want to learn more about herbs, here's what I say. Take five herbs that you would like to know more about and learn everything about those five herbs, including the Latin name, the binomial, which is a hard Latin name. And uh, because if you travel anywhere in the world, the common name is going to change from location to location. And if you know the botanical name, you can talk to people all over the world about that plant. So now yarrow is Achillea millifolia. And Achillea goes to the myth of Achilles. And it's a myth that Achilles' mom held him by his heel and dipped him in the water and said, you will be protected forever, except there was that heel that didn't get dipped in the water. And he got injured there and was bleeding to death, but the leaves, you could say millifolia is like thousands of leaves, thousands of little leaves. And if you crush up the leaf, say you guys are shaving and you cut yourself, grab a yarrow leaf, put it right on your cut, and it's a natural stick. It will stop bleeding. It will stop bleeding right away. So Achillea millifolia is also a very helpful remedy herb. And uh, if you're not allergic to yarrow, it makes a very nice tea and also helps to bring fever down. So, okay, go ahead. All right, so now, just to give you an overview, you can have 
lots of different types of root guidance. Yep. Ooh, oh, oh. But it doesn't matter. I'll come. So suppose you want a culinary herb garden. Oh, that was the beginning of what happened. Okay, here's where I do attack this. <laughs> All right, so you can have a culinary herb garden. And if you are going to have a culinary herb garden or a kitchen herb garden, you should try to have those herbs maybe in containers on your front porch or on a deck, but near your kitchen. So you can go out as you're preparing things and get fresh herbs. And, oh, <laughs> oh no. All right, well, uh, okay, so some culinary herbs that are my favorite anyway. We, we need help, where are you? Come back, I don't know why I decided to. Did I pull this out? Is this something? Yes, I got a computer. All right, so let me tell you, um, in alphabetical order anyway. So there's basil, and there's many different kinds of basil. The sweet basil, you really want to wait until it's this temperature, to what soil temperature is at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit before you plant sweet basil, and that's now, and more after Memorial Day. But then there's Thai basil, lemon basil, there's a million varieties. And if you're doing culinary, then here's what I want to say to you. Go into your garden center, or wherever you're getting them, or your neighbor, and take the newest baby leaf from the top of the plant and put it on the tip of your tongue. If you love that flavor, buy that herb. If you do not love that flavor, do this. Okay? You don't need to do it. Uh, the other thing, and garden centers aren't that happy when you do it, but I recommend it, and that is, if you can, pull the plant out of its pot and take a look to see if it's root bound. If it's root bound, no, you don't need that. I mean, you can make it grow, but why should you? <coughs> Buy one that has nice, fluffy soil and the roots are spread. So those are two things. One, culinary herbs, you want to taste the newest baby leaf right on the tip of your tongue and see if you like it. There's so many flavors in culinary herbs, you might as well get the ones that are tasty to you. Um, Bay leaf is another one, but I don't know if it will grow for you here. You could probably grow it bay, but then you'll have to bring it in in winter, probably, and have a little bay <coughs> tree or something. Um, oh, no, nothing to show you yet? All right, well, anyway, we'll just stop. No, 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 second. You think? All right, we'll go back. So there's catnip. Now, how many of you have cats and have ever seen cats? So what happens with a cat? What happens? Bonkers. Bonkers is a good word. Yeah. So cats go absolutely psychedelic with, I mean, they will even pull your cat net out of your garden and roll in it and just be totally happy with it. And that's why you should plant marigolds, beneficial plant in front, because it fools their sense of smell and they will leave it at least, you know, in your garden bed. The other thing that is fascinating about catnip it's Nepeta cataria, is the botanical name, Nepeta, it's part of that. Oh, well, all right, it's happening maybe. Um, is that for people, catnip gives you a 180 degree different response. If you make a tea of catnip a half hour before you go to bed at night, it helps you to sleep. So it shows you that when they do all these experiments on rats and cats, it's not necessarily gonna be the same for us, but anyway, so that's catnip. It's good for us and cats lover. Um, chives is another. Um, there's garlic chives and regular chives. And uh, Steve and I make with the chive blossoms that are the soft lavender color. We collect the blossoms, rinse them off overnight with paper towels. Next day, throw them into a big jar and pour hot uh, white wine vinegar over the blossoms and then put a wax paper because it's vinegar, and let it sit, not necessarily in the sun, but in a sort of shady place for up to a month. Then what's gonna happen is that the vinegar is gonna turn the color of the flowers. You strain out the flowers, and you have a salad, beginnings of a salad dressing. You'll never have to buy salad dressing again. And if you go to my website, I might have the, re the exact recipe for it, it's called chai blossom vinegar, and you mix that with a little olive oil, salt, pepper, and garlic powder, and you've got it, and you can even 
give it to people as Christmas gifts and holiday gifts, and they'll stand in line the following year to have it for free. So, and right now, all the chai blossoms are blossoming, so this is the time. And if you have neighbors that have gardens and they're not making chai blossom vinegar, ask if you can cut their blossoms off. It won't <laughs> hurt the chives at all. So chai blossom vinegar is fabulous and wonderful. Uh, coriander is another culinary. Dill, fennel, ginger, and lovage. How many people know lovage? A bunch of you know lovage. Well, we in the Herb Society love lovage. We love it. If you taste the leaf of lovage, it's a member of the celery family. Um, it tastes like it should be in your chicken soup. <laughs> it's just so good. It's really yummy, 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 and you can do it a lot with lovage. You could go into stews, you can go into anything, and it's a very hardy plant, and it's a perennial, so it will come back. I actually did have a list of annuals and perennials. Um, but, uh, all right. Hmm. All right, so perennial type herbs that are fun are angelica. How many people have ever, angelica, arch angelica? For me, when, it takes, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, good. Are right, we done? Okay, so catnip, chives, still, fennel, ginger, love it. Does anybody have any questions about those? Okay. Talking about ginger, are you using only the root or can you use the leaf? To be honest, uh, I've only grown it as an ornamental plant, but what you do is if you want to try to grow ginger, I do it as an indoor house plant. And when you go to the market, like a Whole Foods, look for the rhizome of ginger that has a little green nubs on it. Like, I want to grow, I want to grow. Then lay it on top of soil, and it will send its roots down and grow you the most beautiful plant. And we'll need to bring it in. But I don't know, has anybody grown ginger? And what have you done with that? No. Well, I put it down a bit. Oh. I buried it in the soil. I didn't realize I could just lay it on top. Lay it on top. Okay. All right. Did it over you? You just, I think you have green thumbs. <laughs> all right, well, all right. I just knew this would wake people up, but that is a true photo of what happens when cats are playing with them. All right, I just got all. No, I can't imagine this. The fennel, and there's ginger, that's what it looks like in the supermarket. And just look for some that have green nuts, like they really get grow. Go on. Lovage, so it is a member of the celery family, and I forgot, Lovage has hollow stems. So what you can do once it gets to a good size is break off the stems and use the stems as straws and blood mary. It's really good to have like celery in. All right, so mints, there are tons of mints. Now, if you buy different mint, a lot of people like peppermint, they like spearmint, they like chocolate mint. Don't plant all your mints in the same container. Why? Who knows why? That is exactly it. The bees go, oh, look, this. we'll just spend our time here. And then in a year or two, they all taste the same. So if you're going to plant different mints, plant them apart from each other. You could also yeah. you could nip their flowers off so they don't pollinate and just let them spread and in your go garden. that way. Well, you could try that. If you're around all the time, you should do that, but you're good. Here. Do you have a How close is two, like, what would you say, like, if I had a very small yard, like, how far apart could I get away with? Who wants to say that? I have mints that have been cheap by Gal, and they're still good. I know, I, everything grows great for herself. Marriage. Talk to marriage. She has a green thumb. She has a green thumb. Maybe she doesn't have any bees. I'm not sure. I do have bees. You have bees too. I told you. There's always one in every crop. But I would say, are you going to plant it in the ground or in a container? So then another container. And just not that far, it's okay, just so the bee has to work harder. Okay, um, oregano, the most tasty for me is Greek oregano, but then the same thing, you want oregano, you have an Italian, you like cooking Italian food, taste the baby leaf and see if you like that taste of it. Uh, parsley, again, I sort of like flat leaf parsley, I like the taste of it. Curly leaf parsley is nicer for a presentation Plate, but flat leaf goes in everything. Rosemary, uh, 
where we live in New England, rosemary is iffy to make it over the winter. And so we people try to bring it in, so it's going to make it over the winter. I don't know. How about here? Does rosemary make it? I didn't. Yeah. Sometimes it does. It's iffy. So do you ever bring it in? Yeah. yeah. All right. So have you had luck with it when you bring it in? Yeah. It the heat in the house. No, it, it does. dies in March every year. Okay, here's the answer because I had the same problem. Yeah. So right around February, March, it's like I can't stand it in here anymore. Mm -hmm. Al. So move it over to near a door so that it gets the wind and the coolness. Not all the time, but every time you open the door, the um, the rosemary is getting some fresh air. It feels like it's like in solitary confinement. <laughs> so try that. Or uh, if you have a cool basement or a cool garage, you could try to put it there. It depends. But try to put it near a door. Yeah? I just had a herbicide member who did pretty well with it. He did it in the back because of the moisture in the bathroom. Oh, and that did? Oh. Well, but maybe when she was taking a shower, we were going to go to it. All right, and then there's sage. There's different kinds of sage. Tarragon, thyme, different flavors of thyme. Go, go, go. So there's some looks at what they all look like. Uh, we talked about mostly all of those. All right, we're going to just go fast because we're running out of time. Oh, no. Oh, fragrant herbs. Okay, so besides culinary herbs, you want fragrant herbs. And some are both. They say that. Chamomile, the chamomile is also good for a tea garden. Say you want to just have an herbal tea garden and grow just things for teas. Feverfew uh, is fragrant, but Feverfew actually is an amazing, and I should probably wait till we get to remedy herbs, but if you know someone that has migraines, if they take one leaf and put it on a sandwich every day from the Feverfew plant, it will lessen the migraines. They actually uh, grow it in big fields on uh, kibbutzim in Israel, and they call it migra few, and they measure the amount of phenolides or whatever. But you can grow fever few, and it, it, you don't want to eat two leaves a day, just one leaf a day in a sandwich or in a salad. Lavender, lemon balm, these are all going to attract bees and butterflies and pollinators. Go ahead. Chamomile, and there's uh, a couple kinds, there's Roman and German, and it has like an apple flavor. It's like chamomile is like apple. And, and chamomile is also, oops, all right, wait. Chamomile is also very relaxing. It's a nice tea to drink. But some people are sensitive to it. And so you have to find out that they're not allergic. Fever cube, that's what it looks like. A cute little daisy, but the leaves. Next, lavender, and there's different kinds of lavender. And that's certainly fragrant. Go ahead. Lemon balm, that can take over your yard, but you can make lemon balm bread. Does anybody make any recipes with lemon balm? Lemon balm pesto is really good. Lemon balm pesto, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think most of the stuff in pesto are lemon balm. Really good. We have to talk about America. Everything. All right, next. All right, so aloe. Uh, we have aloe pictures coming up. Uh, just quickly. All right, so oh, stay there for a minute because we're rushing. So aloe. There is aloe vera, which has a white gel, and aloe barbadensis. Think of Barbados, but it's barbadensis. It's from Africa. It has little white dots on it with, on the green leaves. But when you slice it open, it has a green gel. That really works very well on irritated skin or bruises. Arnica, how many people know about Arnica? Arnica is like amazing. But usually you get a homeopathic cream of it. Arnica Montana, it comes from the mountains. It's a mountain daisy. You would use it anytime you bang yourself and you get a black and blue mark, but you don't, not on broken skin, you put the Arnica gel and it stops the blood from pooling under your skin and the black and blue goes away and the swelling goes down. Yeah, it hurts because you bumped it, but you can't, no one else can see it. So Arnica is wonderful from that point of view, but not under the skin. Calendula means that it, it's like a calendar. The flower follows the sun, and it makes a fabulous skin cream. It's used on babies that have like eczema or a little scalp cap. Um, comfrey, comfrey um, was used in the old days. Uh, they called it nip bone. 
and people would take a cloth, if they broke their bone or if they sprained it, they would put like a piece of cotton around them and then dip the comfrey leaves in hot, hot water until they got soft, wrap the comfrey around their broken bone, and it would usually heal. So, but they're not recommending drinking comfrey these days because it has some ingredients they're not happy with. Cranberry, cranberry is, this is a little hint, if you get urinary infections, you want to drink cranberry juice, but it can't have sugar in it. It has to be unsweetened. So now, how many people have ever tried to drink the unsweetened cranberry juice? It is so difficult. So here is a way to get around that, and that is pour the unsweetened cranberry juice into ice cube trays, plastic ice cube trays, freeze it. And then when you need to take it, throw that ice cube into some nice seltzer water, you're getting the, cran the unsweetened cranberry juice, and it isn't like disgusting. Okay. <laughs> echinacea, echinacea actually, and it, right, so quick lesson. Echinacea angustifolia uh, means that it's been used for a long time. I know we have to go. But echinacea actually helps to build your immune system, it helps to build your T, t fighter cells. Next. All right, so this is the aloe barbadensis. There's little white dots next. This is Arnica Montana. I was wrong, I said white daisy, yellow daisy. This is calendula, which is beautiful orange flower, makes a great skin cream. Next. Comfrey has actually really pretty lavender flowers and the leaves. Cranberry, that grows in New England. Echinacea, this is uh, Echinacea purpurea, really pretty. Next. Okay, so then more remedy herbs, garlic, ginger root, lavender mix, rosemary, St. John's wort. Does, do you know about St. John's wort? It is a nervine, and if you have nerve pain, this is an amazing plant. It usually blooms around June 21st in my area. That's why they call it St. John. It's his birthday, St. John's wort. Wort is another word for herb. W-O-R-T equals herb, old-fashioned herb. And if you, um, you take the yellow flowers and the green leaves and you throw it into a jar. So you have yellow flowers, green leaves, and then olive oil, green. And then you put it in a jar and you leave it in a sunny window and it will turn blood red. And when it turns blood red, it's ready. Then you strain it out and you just pat it on wherever you have nerve or muscle pain. But it might make you more sensitive to the sun. So and if you're taking some other meds, you need to ask your doctor, but it's amazing. It is amazing. I, uh, garlic, we're gonna go through these really fast because we're out of time. St. John's Wort, it's Hypericum perforatum because when you hold the petals up to the sun, you can see little dots, little perforations. They're not, they're oil plants. Valeria, now there's a flower, officinalis. When the second word is officinalis, it means that it has been used for 5,000 years for medicine. And um, the thing about Valeria, it's a really pretty plant, but the flowers smell like dirty socks. <laughs> okay. Are we, okay, questions? Yeah. Oh, wait, all right, so let me just say, if you want to talk later, and you have questions about your deer or your bunny yeah. rabbits, I do have some answers. Some of them are disgusting, but your things you could do. Okay. Questions? <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. I suppose I have St. John's root, but it worked. Yeah, okay. You don't have St. John's work. We can, you have to look at the flower. Uh, it does grow wild on Cape Cod. I don't know about here. There's a bush one. The ground one is in the distance. It's not those yellow flowers. They really don't come until probably July. Yeah, but they grow the first year. I, I've always had the flower shot. Okay. And, and it don't spread. It spreads. Yeah. Just like the malaria. The malaria root goes everywhere. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Are there differences in the fever few flowers? Um, I understand that there's a remedy for arthritis that fever few is also good for. And specific, there are different kinds of fever few plants. 
you would need to tell me the botanical name. Uh, oh no, and I'm blocking on what. One that the, really helps you for arthritis. And what do you do with it? Uh, teas. Drink the tea. And you're sure it's fever fuel? Fever fuel. I mean, I've been to the big the fields of growing it in Israel, and they really only use it for migraine. So that's Tanacetum parthenium. And so that's the only one I know. But I'll give you my card, and if you can find it, I would love to know. Seriously? I would love to know. Okay? Yeah. It's good for um, carpet tunnel. Um, all right, here's what I'm going to tell you really fast because it's not a fast answer. So one of the books that I wrote is called Natural Hand Care. You can get it out of the library, Normal Weinberg, uh, published by Storybooks. Um, a lot of it are there exercises to do and even the way you carry things, like don't carry hangers like this, you know, or anything like this. Um, but natural hand care, you can get it on Amazon.com, half price for less now because it's out of print. And uh, pretty much the shipping is more than a book, but it is really a good book because it has an index in the back where you can look up paper cuts, you can look up carpal tunnel syndrome, you can look up anything and you'll find really remedies that, um, that should be helpful. If they think of it as a repetitive motion, Problem? I'm not sure. It is certainly pressing on the carbon and the tunnel nerve. I forget which nerve it is. Mm -hmm. What? The tunnel is where the nerve is going through. Thank you. Right, it's been a while since I looked at that. But anyway, it's called natural hand care. Now, the thing about natural hand care, I'm not making any money on this since it's out of print now, is that what covers your hands covers your body. So it is amazing for your skincare. And I started out working on this book um, by going to dermatologists and then asking them how to take care of whatever. There was one doctor in Boston that said that he only specialized in fingernails. <laughs> so I made an appointment wow. just to see, because that was hard to believe. And I read it and I had this rash and went, oh no, only fingernails. But after I finished there, I realized that there were not enough answers there, and I spent a year interviewing grandmas and grandpas all over the world for what works for them, and that's what's in natural hand care, and really with simple, easy things, you can really bring relief in a lot of cases. Okay, any other? I think we have time for one more question. One more question. Really rush. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, are there specific, I have a shade garden, so, and I'm not Yes, there are. Um, and I'm going to block. All right, so would you stand up and say that nice and loud? Uh, I have this question every year, and there's a section of the herb garden in Mellon Park that is herbs that grow in the shade. In Mellon Park? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a bunch of it's, it's just down in the shade of the Phipps Garden Center. You walk down the hill. And you can look at it. Do you use sweet woodruff for anything? Do you ever make a tea? Oh, oh, tea with yeah. sweet woodruff? May wine. May, all right, sweet woodruff. You can make may wine and you can make a tea of sweet woodruff. That's a shader. That's a really pretty one with little white flowers. All right, I guess goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.